The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christie's.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello, it's The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, Nigeria heads to the polls this weekend. What are the implications for its museums and art scene? Plus, a former guard at the Metropolitan Museum of Art on his new book about the museum and a fantasy garden by Hubert Robert. As Nigeria faces a pivotal election this weekend, I talked to Dolly Kolobalagoon, director of the Retro Africa Gallery in Abuja, about the contenders and the importance of art and culture more widely to the country's future. I also talked to Patrick Bringley, the author of a new book, All the Beauty in the World, the Metropolitan Museum of Art and Me, in which he reflects on his experiences as a guard at the museum and coming to terms with the loss of his brother. And this episode's work of the week is Boats in Front of the Grotto in the Park at Merrivale, made by Hubert Robert. It features In the Garden, Six Centuries of Art and Nature at the National Museum in Stockholm, whose curator, Magnus Olausen, tells us about the painting. Before all that, the new series of our sister podcast, A Brush With, is now complete. The latest episode is an in-depth interview with the painter Amy Silman. You can subscribe and listen to the full back catalogue of more than 60 conversations wherever you're listening. Do also subscribe to this podcast while you're at it and leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Now, this weekend, Nigerian voters go to the polls to elect a new president. Whoever wins the election will mark a moment of significant change for the country. The outgoing president, Muhammadu Buhari, has held sway over the country's political system for decades. But will the election mark a moment of transformation for Nigeria's museums and its art scene too? I spoke to Dolly Kolobalagun, director of the Retro Africa Gallery in Abuja, about Nigeria's present cultural status and her hopes for the future. Dolly, there's an election this coming Saturday in Nigeria, and I'm reading everywhere that it's a particularly pivotal election. Can you say why? I mean, this is a very exciting time for Nigeria generally. We have an election on Saturday uh, in which we have three potential contenders vying for the highest office in the land. The reason why it's particularly unique is because for the first time we have a three horse race as opposed to the regular two horse race. Nigeria is a two party state. But now we have a sort of dark horse, new contender that is being painted as an anti-establishment candidate and is very much liked by many southern youth. This is Peter Obi. Peter Obi, exactly. So this has made it harder to predict what direction the uh, election is going to go. The other dimension is that the three candidates represent the three largest ethnic groups in Nigeria. I see. And so there's a lot of tension in terms of tribal and religious and regional conflict and pressure and so a lot of people are sort of on edge waiting to see what the outcome of the election will be. That's interesting and tell us about what's going on at the moment because I understand there's this currency issue in the country at the moment can you give us more detail on that? Well Nigeria has been on the brink of economic collapse we've had several years of economic decline and as a result we have suffered Globally, I'm sure, massive inflation. But in our case, because of both the combination of mismanaged fiscal and monetary policy, the economy is really on the downturn. And so one of the solutions that the CBN, the Central Bank of Nigeria, came up with was finding a means to sort of mop up a lot of the excess cash in the system because they found that, one, most Nigerians are unbanked. um, And so also a lot of the cash in circulation isn't in the banks but are in people's homes. And so they thought that's one way to fight inflation. The other thing is, as other people have suspected, the timing is slightly politically motivated because money plays a large role in the electioneering process in Nigeria, notably in the event of vote buying. And so there has been a suspicion that one of the reasons why the rollout has given people such a short amount of time to be able to give in their old notes to replace with new notes and that in addition to that, that there are not many new notes available, even for the common man to access, is out of the concern and fear that one of the major political parties or the other ones in general would use money to buy votes on election day. Now, on the one hand, that sounds like a great and admirable policy to prevent election buying. On the other hand, it's creating enormous hardship for the masses and for the population who rely on cash to go up to transact, to go about their daily 
activity, to take buses, to pay for things in the market. And so we're seeing a lot of anger and the things are bubbling up to the surface at the moment. Yeah, it does sound like a very tense situation there. We're obviously going to talk about culture now. And what I'm really interested in is that I know that you attended a kind of round table. Is that right? With uh, yes. Atiku Abubakar, who's yes. one of the candidates. It's interesting to me because what we like to explore on this podcast is to what extent culture is at the centre of political campaigns and so on. Yeah. It, what's your perception of the three leading candidates' approach and particularly about Abu Bakr's approach and why that was significant to be invited to something like that? Well, I have publicly declared that I lean towards Atiku Abu Bakr as a presidential candidate because of many reasons, but also because of the culture aspect. So outside of being a gallerist uh, curator, uh, I do advise governments on culture and tourism development policy, I and mean, I've done so in a bipartisan manner. But this was one of the opportunities that I saw to be able to sort of, in the coming election, help guide the framework and policies for the potential next president to be able to take culture into account as a significant contributor to the Nigerian economy and to be able to create, uh, put in place opportunities and financial, but also uh, legislative opportunities and to plug certain gaps to allow the industry to thrive, which has mainly been private sector driven, with very little, if any, government support. And so I think the demographics of Nigeria has changed. So you have all of these new industries that have emerged that are thriving and have global recognition, but domestically they're struggling because there is not enough or sufficient top-down policy consciousness to be able to allow us to really um, expand to the degree that we would like to. And so I found that this was an opportune moment for me to be able to sit down with a presidential candidate, as well as many other people from various industries. I think people from film, fashion, animation, comic books were represented as well as architects to discuss the future of culture in Nigeria. And for the next administration to have a conscientious approach in when talking about, because Atikul Obaka's plan is to restructure Nigeria, in the event of a restructured Nigeria, we're talking about a diversified economy. Culture needs to be taken seriously, not just as a means for leisure for people to simply, you know, enjoy themselves or passively collect or passively listen to music, but really as a major net contributor to our economy with various subdivisions within that term to exploit and explore. I'm really interested in that sort of balance between the private sector and the public sector. Like, for instance, I had Tokeni Peter Seidsch for Beagle on the podcast last year, yeah. and we were talking about an art fair, this very thriving art fair on the one hand. Artex Lagos. Yeah, exactly, Artex Lagos. And, and then you are in Abuja with a gallery, and it's, you know, again, there seems to be a quite an advanced and, and sophisticated scene and so on. And then at the same time, we we're also hearing about sort of quite a major museum project in Benin City, and yet... Is it right that with not so much funding that the institutional sector is very underdeveloped? Yes, absolutely. That's completely correct. In fact, that was one of my primary contributions at the roundtable and just in general. So in terms of what I do as a policy advisor is really in the realm, so far at least, of institution building and advocacy. So outside of the Benin Museum, which is up and coming, there is another museum which is to be titled the ICAF, the Institute of Contemporary Art and Film, which is being built and actually near completion, about 93 to 95% complete in terms of construction in Ilari, which is the capital of Kwara, um, of which I was a major contributor to the project as the art advisor uh, to the governor. And so this museum is supposed to be a museum focused and dedicated to contemporary African art solely. And I think it's extremely exciting because this means that you then have potentially the next five years in Nigeria, the emergence of the MOR Museum in uh, Benin, the Institute of Contemporary Art in Ilori, and then now we've just had the inauguration of the Museum of Yoruba History in Lagos as well, which is affiliated with, I believe, the British Museum that's also emerged. That's the John Randall Centre, is that jo right? Yes, yeah. the John yeah. Randall Centre, exactly. And so this is an exciting time. But there isn't enough. And so I think that we're on the cusp and there is a lot of consciousness, at least in our industry, that these institutions matter, they need to exist, that they're important for heritage preservation, but also documenting the evolution of our scene and our industry outside of the commercial space. And so it's just important to get government to sort of key into that and understand that these things are important and to fund them. 
Can you give us a flavour of how centralised or regionally independent Nigeria is? Because obviously it's important if individual states within the country are going to be able to put in place cultural projects and so on, that there would be a certain level of independence in funding and so on. So can you give us a bit of a flavour of how that works in the country? Yeah, that's a very good question, actually. I mean, ironically, these three museums I spoke of are all three state-initiated projects. So, so far, none of the museums that are coming up are federal government projects. And yet we have a Ministry of Tourism and Culture. And so the question is, what does that ministry serve? Now, in terms of structurally, the way the Nigerian government works is, in theory, it's supposed to be a federation. And so it's sort of modeled after the United States. We have 36 states. And the states are supposed to be somewhat autonomous with federal government overview. But in practice, that's not the case. Now, our constitution has not fully devolved powers to states to really allow them to be financially independent to the degree that we would like. And that's one of the main talking points for this election. Um, And one of the platforms that some of the candidates are campaigning on, restructuring, which essentially means in our case, fiscal federalism, devolving tax powers to states devolving licensing powers to the states, allowing states to have more independence so that they can drive their own initiatives and federal government mainly just takes care of national policy. Now, a lot of states aren't viable economically. Uh, they're not very wealthy. They depend on federal government allocations every month, every year to be able to sustain themselves. And so very few states can drive projects of this scale on their own. So far, what we've seen is sort of this ingenious way of fundraising, which are essentially PPP partnerships between public and private sector in these states that have managed to drive these projects by sort of partnering with the private sector to raise funds and then creating trusts of sorts to essentially allow the private sector to manage and for the states to essentially provide things like subsidy or land or just public support. And so, so far it's worked in a way, but it's not sustainable in the long term because as everybody knows, museums function through grants, through patronage, through subsidies. So it's one thing to build the building, it's another thing to have a program that's lasting, that's robust, that's significant, and that can sustain and last the test of time. And that's where we need the federal government to provide financial support and all sorts of different you know, support that we can think of from a policy standpoint. Absolutely. And and of course, we hear about the National Commission for Museums and Monuments, as particularly within the field of repatriation. And I'm wondering, because it's a national commission, does it therefore have powers to influence government in a way that will help the structures that you were just discussing actually develop with a bit more pace and a bit more energy, if you like? Yes. Well, the National Commission for Museum and Monuments, it's a federal government agency, actually. And technically under the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Culture and Tourism Development. However, in my opinion, they're not doing much And the reason why they're not doing much is because there's a top-down approach in Nigeria in terms of how things function. If the president doesn't care for tourism and cultural development, then the minister doesn't care. If the minister doesn't care for it, then he doesn't fund or supervise or really take into account what the National Commission is doing. And so what we then have is a lot of federal government museums are dilapidated, their embarrassments. If you actually visit the spaces, many of them don't have basic infrastructure, no lights or electricity, nothing to really house some of the treasures that they're supposed to protect. And so that's why I feel that the top-down approach is important because you can't just have private sector-driven initiatives for museums. You need the government to take it seriously. And I'm, I'm optimistic, I think, that something that will potentially change in the next administration. Now, of course, I want my preferred candidate to win, but I think all three are very much aware of the fact that things are changing in Nigeria. Uh, the days of simply just focusing on oil and gas extraction and export, and then at most the banking sector and telecommunications sector isn't sufficient to really have a diversified economy. And given sort of the waves that Nigeria has been making in the film, music industry, but also art, I, for example, will be exhibiting for the first time at Art Basel Hong Kong next month, um, showcasing one of my artists, Victor Ekemeno. You're having Nigerian galleries, you know, some of the largest platforms in the world, and the government isn't even aware that's happening. So that's it. Another thing is we also need Nigeria to be present in biennales like Venice, for example, that requires government support. So I think that there's a path forward and I am optimistic, yes. In summary then, I mentioned that it's a pivotal moment for Nigeria as a country, but it sounds like it really is a pivotal moment for Nigerian culture. 
Yes, it is. I think so. In an exciting way, I think. I hope. But I guess we'll see how it actually pans out in three days in, in, in practice. Well, Dolly, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. <laughs> thank you very much, Ben. It was such a pleasure to be here. You can read more about Nigeria in the March print issue of the Art Newspaper, which is out on the 1st of March, and at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iOS and Android. Coming up, how being a guard at the Met helped Patrick Bringley process his grief after the death of his brother, and a Hubert Robert painting in Stockholm. But first, here's this week's news bulletin. The Victorian Albert Museum in London has secured the archive of David Bowie. The iconic musician, artist and fashion icon who died in 2016 had kept some 80,000 pieces from across his career, including his costume ensemble from his seminal Ziggy Stardust period, album artwork, set designs and sheet music. From 2025, the archive will be housed at the V&A's new site, the V&A East Storehouse in the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park in East London, in a dedicated space called the David Bowie Centre for the Study of Performing Arts. The centre will be free to visitors. A Jeff Kuhn ceramic balloon dog sculpture was smashed at an art fair in Miami last week. The blue porcelain sculpture was about 15 inches tall and was priced at $42,000 on the booth of Bel Air Fine Art Galleries, which runs 25 venues worldwide at the Art Wynwood Fair. A visitor accidentally knocked over the work at the cocktail preview. The district manager of Bel Air Fine Art, Cedric Buero, said that it was heartbreaking to see an iconic piece destroyed, but that the collector unintentionally gave a little kick to the pedestal that supported the sculpture. The Joe Mitchell Foundation, which oversees the late US artist's estate, sent a cease and desist letter to the luxury brand Louis Vuitton on Tuesday, claiming that the company used Mitchell's work in advertisements for handbags without the foundation's approval. Photographs on Louis Vuitton's website until Tuesday afternoon show the French actress Léa Sedou modelling bags in front of what appeared to be Mitchell's colourful abstract canvases. The foundation said in a statement that it had denied repeated requests from Louis Vuitton last year to use Mitchell's work in a brand advertising campaign, citing its long-standing policy that images of Mitchell's art can only be used for educational purposes. LVMH, Louis Vuitton's parent company, did not immediately reply to the art newspaper's request for comment. You can hear our podcast about luxury brands and art in the episode from the 27th of January this year and read all these stories and much more on the website or the app. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. As part of their 20th 21st Century Art Auction Series in London, Christie's presents Memory of a Surreal Journey, property from an important San Francisco Bay Area collection, a group of 25 works dedicated to showcasing the magical interpretations of the world by leading artists of the Surrealist movement across Europe, Latin America and America. The collection was built over more than two decades around a formative trip to Mexico, the Surrealist place par excellence as described by André Breton. This fantastic grouping will be offered across two auctions, including the Art of the Surreal Evening Sale on the 28th of February, where works by Leonora Carrington and Remedios Faro will make their debut on this sale platform, and the Impressionist and Modern Art Day and Works on Paper Sale on the 3rd of March. Further highlights include seminal paintings by Oscar Dominguez, André Masson, René Magritte and Yves Tongi. Discover more at christies.com. Welcome back. Now, in the autumn of 2008, a few months after the death from cancer of his brother Tom, Patrick Bringley began a job as a guard at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. He would work there for more than a decade and has now written a memoir about his time at the Met and how his experiences of standing among the collections of one of the world's greatest museums are inextricably linked to the family tragedy that preceded it. I spoke to Patrick about the book. Patrick, your story begins in a different museum to the one that it's all about, really, doesn't it? Because it begins in the Philadelphia Museum of Art rather than the Met. So I wonder if you wouldn't mind telling us about that, if you like, origin story for the whole story. Sure. Well, uh, my mother's from Philadelphia and my brother died very young. And in the aftermath of him dying, we had went and visited my mother's siblings. She has a lot of siblings in Philadelphia. And You know, that is a very comforting experience, but also, you know, a trying and difficult one, of course, you know, being with family after a sort of traumatic loss like that. He had been ill for a long time 
And she had the idea of escaping just the two of us to the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And that's a gorgeous museum. And they particularly are strong in old master paintings, the Johnson Collection, it's called. And we were wandering amidst those paintings. And as so often is the case with old master paintings, they're, you know, so beautiful, but also so sad. There's a kind of luminous sadness to them because they're so often painting pictures of the passion, which is just an old word that means suffering. And obviously we were feeling that. And my mother in particular was feeling that. And she, you know, stood in front of this painting of the Pietà, which is by Niccolo Pietrogerini. And it's just the barest depiction of it um, from the 14th century, I think it is, or maybe the early 15th century. And um, she cried and she cried because her heart was breaking, but also because her heart was brimming over. Um, with, you know, love as well as pain. And I think that's so often what those paintings evoke in us. So, you know, when I was going back to Brooklyn to my home after that, I was thinking, man, you know, wouldn't it be something to spend more time in that atmosphere, that kind of atmosphere of pain, but also beauty and of very fundamental things. And I sort of had the idea to become a guard at the mat. And it's interesting that you say in the book, I badly want to stand still a while. And that's a really interesting double meaning, if you like, in the sense that it's it's about just trying to grasp and harness everything to stand still. And then also literally to stand still in space. And as you say, in perfect lonesomeness. Tell us more about that. Yeah, that's right. I mean, as a guard, at least in America, I think it's different in some places. They make a stand. We stand. So there's this aspect of remaining in a gallery for much longer than a person typically does. Most people in an art museum are passing through that art museum or passing through that gallery. And as a guard, you have eight or 12 hours of pure watchfulness to sort of remain behind and kind of bear witness to what's going on, but also bear witness to the the scenes that are taking place within the artwork. And no, I did not want to rush back to sort of life as normal. I didn't want to sort of rush back to an office job where I would have to, you know, deal with office politics and kind of trivial nonsense that all of a sudden didn't feel as momentous as it did when I was a little bit younger and, and hadn't had this experience. Um, so I was very happy to be a guard in a museum who didn't have to rush around at all. And there's this wonderful sense in which you confront your grief through the collection at the Met. There's a wonderful Titian portrait, which you identify with your brother very directly, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, this is a portrait. It's not a very heralded portrait. He did it when he was 25 years old or about that time. It's of an unknown young man who's also about 25 years old. My brother died when he was 26. I was 25 when I started at the Met. But what is remarkable about the painting is it's so easy. It's so free. It just looks like, I think I say, like a chance reflection on a pond. And it is seems to paint not just a moment, not just a snapshot in time, but something essential about this person. And I think that's oftentimes what a portrait can do. If a portrait is done very well, it seems almost like that picture we have of a person if we close the, our eyes and we have that just one sense of the person, that one sense of my older brother. And like, that's what this picture is. And it's angelic and it's, you know, it's art rather than than just a snapshot. So it was, it was very comforting to me to be around things like that, that were remindful of those sort of essential aspects of people and of life. Absolutely. And also there's this nice section where you talk about a Vermeer interior and about how that reminded you of the times that you were spending and the kind of atmosphere also too of the hospital room that you were visiting your brother and that you tell lovely anecdotes about those times as he was very sick uh, towards the end of his life and it somehow again art puts you in touch with that and allows you to process it a little yeah i mean so many of those vermeer paintings of course they're of these quiet rooms and they're penetrated with lights and there's not anything kind of elevated about them in a sort of traditional sense. They're not sort of a cathedral, they're domestic interiors. But because of the stillness and the silence and the light, there is clearly something kind of holy about them, something majestic about them in that sense. And I think that, 
you know, any of us who have spent time by you know, somebody's bedside or in these sort of quiet little rooms where modern sort of passions are playing out, that because life has been stripped down to something fundamental and kind of bare, and because of the silence and the stillness and because of the love and because of the sort of the essential simplicity, there's this profound beauty at the same time as there's terror and there's, there's tragedy. And yeah, those Vermeer pictures are, are some of many pictures that just seem, for reasons that are hard to articulate, seem heartbreaking at the same time as they're very beautiful. Can you say at what point you started to think of writing descriptions of what you were seeing and experiencing on a daily basis at the Met? Was there a moment, was there a sort of epiphany or did it just sort of creep into your life to a certain degree? You know, I've always scribbled things. And while I was on post, I was certainly thinking thoughts and kind of scribbling things in my mind. I would say maybe seven or eight years into my job, I thought my first idea for a project was, why don't I try to write a guard's guide to the Met? You know, something that uh, goes from artwork to artwork and it has little anecdotes and it has little things that people might not know. But then I, I sort of realized that the world doesn't necessarily need another kind of off-kilter guidebook, that what is not frequently written about, I think, when it comes to art, is the sort of subjective experience of seeing art and not just seeing in a sort of casual sense of, you know, I walked up to this picture and hear what I saw, but this sort of living with it and having relationships with it and this sort of essential mystery of why we're all drawn to these objects. And to sort of write that story, I realized that it would have to be a first person story because people would have to understand who this person is that's having a relationship. And then, you know, it occurred to me, this should probably be about me as a guard, because also I hope that I use the figure as a guard in the book that of course it's me, but it also, I think people can identify with somebody who is in a museum and is maybe quiet and is maybe earnest about trying to make sense of this, this great big world in there. Absolutely. And, and then there's this sort of nice journey that the book takes you on from the very acute grief that you're feeling at the start of the story, if you like, and then on into a, the community of the museum so that your colleagues and so on become part of the story. They become characters within it to a certain degree. And you feel your own personal journey as well as a kind of descriptive journey happening at the same time. Can you say more about that? Because it does seem a very sort of formal structure that you put in place. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's tracked how I experience the place. I mean, you know, especially in those those early months and even years, you know, there's a speechlessness about, I don't know, about my reaction to what had happened, but also about being in a great big museum. I mean, I think oftentimes the first thing we do when we're in such a museum is you just wander from Egypt to Rome to Mesopotamia and you feel so tiny and you feel insignificant and you know what is it that you could possibly say that would be a match for what you're seeing and I think in some sense that's how I did experience my early time there and I sort of relished the kind of lonesome solitary aspect of a guard's role but then you know it's also a job and I became more comfortable and I became more interested in the living world inside the museum as well which includes, you know, 7 million visitors who come in from around the world every single year and includes my colleagues, more than 500 guards who work in the joint. And I think through people, through conversation, I sort of refound kind of my cadence. I began to enjoy just having little conversations when people are like, you know, where's the Mona Lisa? You know, why aren't there dinosaurs here? <laughs> you know, I really enjoyed that and that helped me find my footing. And then kind of in more profound sense, I found my footing through all these relationships with these guards who are from all over the world too, because, you know, it's New York City, and also have their own relationships with the art, their own sort of ways of thinking and being, and this incredible diversity. And, you know, I was there from age 25 to 35, so in that 10 years, I had to kind of figure out, you know, what's the grown-up that I'm going to be? And uh, I, I credit those experiences with helping me sort of find that. Yeah. And, and one of the aspects that I love about the book is that one always has a very particular and necessarily subjective relationship with museums. And one thing I learned so much about through this is the way that people think in museums. And like you mentioned the, the dinosaur hunters who 
turn every corner and there's still no dinosaurs and, and unfortunately they're never going to find a dinosaur in the Met and also the Mona Lisa story as you say that you know the disappointment when they realise the Mona Lisa's not there but also things like this question that you repeatedly get is this real and it never occurred to me that people would think that but but yeah if it's your first time in a museum if you're not from a family that regularly takes you to museums you might not know that everything in the Met is real. <laughs> Oh, 100%. I mean, when people ask that, is this real question, oftentimes they are dead earnest. They just did not know such a thing exists. You know, they might ask that about an Egyptian temple or something, but they might also ask that about a Van Gogh because they sort of vaguely think in their mind that that must be something that's just in some vault in some, you know, rich man's palace or something. And they don't quite understand that, in fact, the greatest works of art are in these public palaces that you and I can can walk into, and they just didn't know that. But then also this this real question is is them just sort of grappling with the kind of insanity of it, like you know that that is an Egyptian temple in New York City that has been rebuilt inside the Met, the Temple of Dender. So even if they kind of you know sort of realize that that's real, they don't get how that could be true, and they sort of latch on to the guard. Because I think a guard is a very approachable figure to most people. You're sort of standing there in a suit, but it's a bit of a threadbare, cheap suit. And you kind of seem like you're going to be on their side. So people oftentimes will use you to sort of direct them. But yeah, there's a the nice phrase where you say that you're content with the silence, but you're perfectly botherable. Yeah. And I imagine actually that's quite a difficult balance to strike isn't it you have to get that right because you don't want to be intimidating or remote so you yeah is it a difficult balance to strike yeah i mean the thing about being a guard is you have so many days and so many hours of the day so you're going to be in different moods and you'll <laughs> notice that people respond to you very differently when you're in different moods if you are preoccupied you're thinking thoughts about you know i don't know how you didn't do some chore that you need to do then people generally will not approach you because they can read that in your face that you don't really want to be talked to. But if you are in a mood where you kind of are wandering the galleries a little bit, not just in your corner and you kind of have an open look on your face or might be making eye contact with people, then people will, will come up to you and say, you know, so what's the deal? I know Goya is famous. I don't know why. What is the story with this guy? You can kind of invite that. There are some really nice little details, like you counted all the figures in the old master gallery paintings. <laughs> and, you know, this is obviously something which happens over a long time. But I wonder, you set yourself this task clearly. And, and I wonder how long did it take and, and what was going through your mind as you were doing that? Yeah, I mean, exactly. I, I mean, I probably started that project, I don't know, a year in or so. And I just thought, you know, why not? I'm in here all the time and it's not hard. I just would do it a gallery at a time in the morning. So I just had a little notebook where I had all the gallery numbers written down. And you really find when you start to count that there's an amazing amount of figures because when you're looking at, you know, a Canaletto or some of these like Venetian ones that have these, these big uh, landscape and, and you're seeing all of these tiny, tiny little gondoliers and things, all these little um, attendees at a bullfight in a Goya picture or something, you'll realize there are hundreds and hundreds of people in this room with me. And it just kind of is fun. I took a little survey, like, you know, what percentage of these pictures are of Jesus? And, you know, how many, how many of them are babies versus how many of them are grown ups? And uh, just kind of get the lay of the land that way. And I, I figured out in section B at that time, it's since expanded quite a bit. And there was, you know, 9,000 some people. And I looked up some town in Tennessee that has that exact same population. <laughs> and there are little funny details like, you know, people are get frustrated by the number of Jesus pictures. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, and that's understandable. Like, I mean, there, there are people who have associations with those pictures, either because they grew up in church and didn't much like it or because they didn't grow up in a church and they, they don't feel as if that speaks to them. I always would try, if I could, to encourage people to realize that those paintings are about things that are very close to the emotional surface. I mean, they're about life and death, and they're about suffering. And you'll notice, interestingly, like the old masters, when they tend to paint Jesus, they're not really painting what is focused on in sermons so much, which is like his ministry and all of these uh, moral ideas that he had. They're more or less obsessed with the beginning and the end. 
They're obsessed with painting the adoration and the mother and child, and they're obsessed with painting the end of his life. And you're like, well, clearly, like this is what resonated with him, this the life and that they were living, if they're in the 14th century, especially in hard times. And they are channeling a huge range of emotions into this one story of this man from first century Judea who had a very hard life. So I think that sort of paradoxically that they are very accessible if you sort of allow yourself to think that way. And then there's also, as a sort of counterpoint in a way to that, there's this wonderful description of the moment in the Islamic galleries when a man prays in front of a mirror and asks you before he does so. So there's this sense in which you want to, as you pointed out earlier, to allude to the diversity of the collections, but absolutely to deal with the diversity of the visitors and the communities for whom the Met has huge importance. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So the Islamic wing of the Met was closed for, I think it was eight or nine years during a huge renovation. And then it reopened and there was a lot of excitement around it. And yeah, a security chief had told me that there's probably going to be people who want to play in front of this mirab. And uh, sure enough, someone did. And we just, you know, as long as they weren't doing a prostration, which might be, you know, getting in people's way, uh, you know, of course. I mean, one thing that, that always struck me is that wandering through any wing of the Met, the artists would be surprised to not find people worshiping these objects. Like these are objects that are not meant to be aesthetic objects to sort of be studied for their period and style. I mean, these objects usually, whether they're Egyptian or European or, or Mesopotamian, they are usually sort of machines. They have some sort of a spiritual purpose and they are meant to be meditated upon um, and create you know, a spiritual awakening in some sense in us. And people do use them for that purpose. But a lot of people, I think, are trained in not a good way to keep things at an arm's length, to think I'm here to study art rather than to study what this art is, you know, to learn about art rather than to learn from the art. And I think that generally that's a peculiar aspect of the way that we look at art. But a lot of people do see through that peculiarity and, and use the collections for their own purposes. There's a moment in the book where you have epiphanies all the way through. So you struggle with Monet to a certain extent, and then you get to the heart of why he's so interesting and significant. But then there's this moment with Mary Cassatt, and you draw really interesting conclusions from that particular epiphany. Can you say more about that? Sure. I mean, yeah, Mary Cassatt, I love her paintings and I didn't end up putting it in the book, but I have a very vivid anecdote too of this father in the American Wing Galleries and his kids were being so annoying and he just blew his gasket at them. And he said, I just want to look at Mary Cassatt. Why won't you let me look at Mary Cassatt? And I felt that as a, a father with small children myself. But her paintings are so beautiful, but they're a little hard to classify because you have them in the American wing, but they are French in the sense that she did most of her work in France. They kind of are Impressionist-like, but they also have so much kind of bulk in the way that an old master painting kind of has bulk. There's a lot of kind of neither fish nor fowl. They're very kind of Japanese at the same time as the French. And I don't know, I would classify them as one of the many paintings that I absolutely adore, but don't really have all that much that's interesting to say about them. I just adore them. I mean, you look at one of those those mother and child and you're just like, it's beautiful. And it's beautiful because of the subject matter, but also because of her obvious insane mastery. And in the book, I, I recounted that I was watching a copyist paint the Mary Cassatt, as, as sometimes will happen at the Met. And as always will be the case, their drawing will be pretty good and their color will be sort of garbage. And it's because it has none of the spontaneity, none of the sort of like soaring on wings that great artists can pull off and none of the freshness, none of the punch. So yeah, I don't, I don't really know what to say, but that's frequently the case. But there's a very nice conclusion that you come to at the end of that incident with the copyist where you have this kind of extreme feeling in front of the cassette and then you realize that that stopped happening so often and you conclude that you're grieving for the grief for your brother that an element of 
time passing has made that grief less acute. And so therefore, you are not so sensitised, it appears, to the collection in the same way that you were when you first took the job. Is that fair? Yes, I think that's true, that oftentimes, you know, there's a sort of quality to the world when you're grieving or when for any particular reason, you're just very open. You're very, very open. And you're just riding the subway home and you see the faces and everyone looks so sympathetic and you're like, man, that person is suffering or, you know, and just time has kind of stopped for you in a way that it hasn't stopped for a lot of others who are just sort of going through their life. And yes, I think I recounted with that Cassatt painting that I had a return of that feeling because the painting was so beautiful and it sort of brings you back to this moment where you just feel so open and the sort of mystery of things, the beauty of things is is very, very apparent to you and also the sadness of things. But in the normal run of life, it's somewhat right that we shouldn't be in that mood all the time because we have to get to business and we have to raise our kids and we have to do whatever it is that we're doing. But yes, yeah, sometimes you do kind of grieve for the end of that particular quality that the world can have. And then, of course, it's a love letter to the Met. It's absolutely a love letter to the Met. But you're not beyond moments of criticism or moments of reflection upon what it is to be a major public institution like this. And there's a moment where you talk about a Benin sculpture and you talk about how, in a way, you long for it not to be in the Met anymore. Yeah. So, you know, all these questions for repatriation, of course, are very, very complicated. And I can't say that as a guard, I have, you know, particular expertise beyond what any of us might have. But also as a guard, you don't want to feel like you're keeping things in that shouldn't be in the museum. I mean, that's not sort of the way the flow of things should be. So, I mean, I support taking just a thoughtful, compassionate, smart, wise, try to figure out what makes the world better rather than worse, case by case, look at the objects that are in Western collections that maybe should be or maybe shouldn't be. I mean, people respond angrily in comments to me that, you know, everything should go back. You know, why, why is this Egyptian object in America? And I mean, that's, of course, not how I feel about things, because you don't want to have a world where you have to hop onto a hundred planes in order to see culture. I mean, culture is a big old mess, but there are also, though, things that clearly were taken in 1897 violently, sort of within living memory, and also from a place that does not have that stuff, you know? Like Egypt, for instance, has a lot of stuff. You know, the stuff in the Met is nothing compared to what's in the Cairo Museum. So when they ask for something back, you almost want to say, well, you know, how about we send you a Monet? And like, you know, how, how about we keep this thing rolling? But in the case of the museum in Benin City that they just built, they need stuff to fill that up. So I'm very hopeful that they'll get it. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you. This was a pleasure. All the Beauty in the World, The Metropolitan Museum of Art and Me by Patrick Bringley is out now in the US, published by Simon & Schuster and priced $27.99. In the UK, it's published by The Bodley Head on the 16th of March and priced £20. And finally, it's time for the work of the week. As we creep towards spring in Europe, the National Museum in Stockholm has just opened The Garden, Six Centuries of Art and Nature, an exhibition featuring 300 works, including paintings from Rembrandt to Renoir. Among them is Boats in Front of the Grotto in the Park at Merreville, a picture by Hubert Robert relating to his designs for the fashionable gardens of the 18th century, so-called English landscape gardens or Jardin à l'Anglaise. I spoke to the curator, Magnus Olesen, about Robert and his work. Magnus, it seems to me that Hubert Robert may be the most apt artist to be talking about in connection with your show because he's both an artist and a garden designer. So tell us more about him. Well, you know, he, he was very famous as, as a ruin painter in Rome. He's very famous for his picturesque uh, views from Rome, more or less artificial constructed. Then in the early 1770s, he, he went back to, to France and he was finally in 1778 created as a dessinateur du jardin du roi, so a, a painter who became actually designer of gardens, a royal designer of gardens. The first thing he did actually was uh, the famous 
Ben Apollon, the, the bath of Apollo, and at Versailles, it's still there, uh, with a kind of theatrical scenery with big artificial rocks. Then he made other landscape gardening for Marie Antoinette, both at uh, Rambouillet and at Petit Trianon. It's, you know, it's remarkable with, with an artist, a painter, who actually became a garden designer because he, he didn't use any proper plan at all. He made drawings, he made paintings. That was his vision, or as the French call it, um, tableau projet. So it's an idea as a painting. And um, the actual painting we are talking about now that is on show and exhibition is such a tableau projet for another garden or park, English-fashioned garden called Meriville, situated 100 kilometers southwest of, uh, of Paris. It still exists, actually. And uh, this painting is fairly small. It measures... 29 to 38 centimeters. We bought it in 2018 on auction in Paris. Just to understand a little bit more, he's making these paintings and they would then be taken to the kind of more practical garden designers, if you like, the people who are putting together the nuts and bolts of this vision, if you like. Well, you know, he was a sort of entrepreneur. So he, a chief designer, he used architects, sculptures, fountaineers as a water uh, engineers and so on all were specialists and as a matter of fact he collaborated with a nephew of the famous François Boucher the painter he was his nephew Yves Elouis Boucher was a sculptor and he made a kind of proportion the models for for these rocks and then you know they were done in huge pieces put together so it, they were real artificial these rocks and uh, both at Versailles and at Maryville, and uh, you can still see them there, actually. So this painting is a kind of his vision, his first vision, that he showed to the patron, Jean-Joseph de Laborde, very rich, famous banker, who had earned his money not in a very nice way. He, he became rich due to the slave trade and um, his uh, sugar plantage in Haiti so right. very controversial today <laughs> absolutely of course absolutely yes. yeah. and, and one of the interesting things about that whole world was this whole idea of these extraordinarily powerful patrons commanding people like Hubert Robert to enact a kind of fantasy to enact a kind of dream world for them yes I mean, he, he ended uh, in the, during the Great Terror. He was beheaded, actually, right. uh, due to his richness, of course. I mean, so he <laughs> finally ended in, in a terrible way. But um, he was so rich that the French government borrowed money for him for the French Expeditionary Corps for the United States to help General Washington. So he paid 13 million pounds or livres at that time in order to support this expeditionary corps. Later on, he was disgraced, and then he actually took the decision to more or less compete with the king himself to lay out a garden or a park. And then he used Hubert Robert for this purpose. Right. And tell us about the technique, because one of the things about Hubert Robert is, is this extraordinary à la prima technique, right? So this very loose and flowing kind of brushwork. It's true. It's it's really a sort of virtuoso piece. Actually, the same technique as you can see in his other paintings of, of ruins from Rome, like a watercolor, more or less, the same sort of effects, with a very lively brushwork and so on. So you get a feeling that it's done very quickly, actually. And um, later on, he made also more finalized paintings showing Merville uh, that he showed uh, among other things, for, for British tourists in Paris in 1790. So his atelier was a sort of public place, more or less, where a sort of show off of his what he had done. Right. But this small painting was really in the beginning of, of the creation of the English landscape garden at Merville. There's an interesting circularity about that, isn't there? That, that the English garden was the fashion at this time in France, and there are paintings being produced of 
English style gardens, which are then being sold to English patrons. It's, a, it's an interesting kind of market dynamic. Yes, they even thought it was more British than the English landscape gardens in England. <laughs> <laughs> they said he was very proud of that. At the same time, they were very chauvinistic. So he, Hubert Robert himself spoke about the French garden. I mean, so, so they, due to the tense relationship with England, they were very keen on really stressing that it, this was a sort of French invention. I mean, it's a bit hard to understand, but, but that was <laughs> the situation these days. The odd semantics of the 18th century. Yes. Tell us about Hubert Robert and that, you know, that language that we were talking about, this very fluid kind of language. It relates very closely in terms of that kind of enjoyment of the paint to his contemporaries and people like Fragonard. And he knew Fragonard, is that right? Yes, Definitely. I mean, I think that if you look at the colors and the way of doing it, it has much to do with the Rococo, actually. Mm. It's a kind of Rococo fashion. There's a good comparison, actually. But it's also interesting, you know, with making pictures for laying out a garden, because this is really what the English call painterly fashion. I mean, the picturesque. It's a vision based on pictures it's not something you make first a plan or design in the traditional way, but really using paintings to explore and to describe your vision. Absolutely. And of course, they're called capricci in, that, in relation to that sort of um, Italian tradition of that period. And he was particularly famous for these. Is that right? And, and also, he was also called Robert des Ruines. Yes. So he would make ruins even of modern buildings. Is that right? So he'd make paintings of modern buildings and turn them into ruin through paint. That's true. The most famous example is the Louvre, the huge gallery in the Louvre seen as a ruin so i mean um, and maybe you can say that he could sense the forthcoming disaster of the french revolution he was actually put in jail during the terror so i mean a sort of vision of the forthcoming disaster with the great terror but nonetheless he lived beyond the terror didn't he and 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 was able to continue to work on gardens and indeed make paintings till quite a late age that's true, but I think that actually, uh, as for gardens, that it ended with the revolution, more or less, because all the, the clients, either they were exiled or they were beheaded, like the poor Marquis de la Borde. So you've acquired this work, as you say, you bought it at auction, but it fits in with other works in your collection by Robert, is that right? That's true. We have actually two views from Maryville, so we thought it was quite natural to acquire this kind of preparatory work or tableau projet in order to be able to tell the whole story. Uh, we have a, uh, quite many drawings. Uh, we also have a couple of very nice paintings, a scenery with the um, Hotel Dieu in fire, actually, fired. So, so it's also a sort of a milieu that was ruined by the fire and, and the same sort of vision of a great disaster. So it was not only the painter of ruins, but also of great disasters. <laughs> <laughs> and, and lastly, your show is about six centuries of art and nature, art and the garden. Yes. So it would seem to me then that, that Hubert Robert sort of fits slap bang in the middle of that, those 600 years. Would that be right? Yes. Uh, there are two other painters, actually, that are included in the, in the show that they worked as designer of gardens. The other one that I would, the first I would mention is Claude Monet, of course, is very famous. Mm -hmm. We has uh, got uh, as a loan from Musée d'Orsay a view of his own garden at Giverny. So we're very happy to, to be able to show that. I mean, a painter who really created his own still life in order, uh, his own motif. And then the Swedish artist Carl Larsson, who also created his garden in Dalekalia as a sort of still life, uh, as a milieu he used for, for his drawings, his paintings, and his books. He wrote books on, on this published book, A Home, which was shown at the Victoria and Albert Museum 25 years ago, I think. Well, Magnus, thank you so much for telling us about Hubert Robert. Thank you. A pleasure. The Garden, Six Centuries of Art and Nature is at the National Museum in Stockholm, Sweden until the 7th of January 2024.
And that's it for this episode. You can find us on Twitter at Town Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Amy Dawson and David Clack. And David also does the editing and sound design. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to our guests, Dolly, Patrick and Magnus. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.